Welcome everybody. I think so many times we think our child is being included in general ed classes, but the reality is they might not be actively participating in that classroom. So tonight we are so privileged because we have a wonderful um, inclusion guru, I will call her, <laughs> Charlene Comstock Galligan, that is going to be our special guest. And she is not only going to give us inspiration, but practical tips and a new way of looking at things. So um, before we jump into our content, let me just give a quick introduction of myself if we haven't met. I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm a parent, a retired teacher. Um, an author of an Amazon number one best-selling book, The Art of Advocacy, and I'm also a full-time advocate where my passion is to help parents become even more effective advocates so their kids can be safe, happy, and learning every day with their friends at school. So, as I said, we have a wonderful guest with us tonight. I first met Charlene in purpose, in purpose. <laughs> it was a purpose to meet you. Yes. <laughs> in person in 2010, I had to look it up tonight when I met her in Austin. I was a breakout speaker at a conference that she organized for many years, Inclusion Works. Um, my dear friend Kathy Snow also had been talking about Charlene for years, so I was just so excited to um, to finally meet her. And you know, when we look at all the different roles that Charlene's had in her career as being an educator, an advocate, uh, a friend to teachers and parents, it's like so interesting because her background is so rich and diverse that she, th this is why I think she is just such a wonderful um, person that will help us develop some new insights tonight. She's been a special ed teacher, an instructional specialist. She's what I love, the, the title of uh, Chief of Innovation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which, which sometimes is called Special Ed Director. <laughs> mm -hmm. But she's worked for Parent Training and Information Center. She's worked for the Art of um, Texas. So I find Charlene just this bubbling firecracker of a positive person that will keep you laughing, keep you looking at the positive sides of life. But you can also engage in a really serious conversation and really explore the avenues and the journey that we're on as we try to have our children accepted, um, included in general ed classes. So Charlene, welcome. Charmaine, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And to me, it's a privilege to be here. So we are just having a big love fest about, you know, how much we, we like being together and working together and how we don't do it often enough. So I'm delighted to have been invited and I hope to make an opportunity to work with the, the families and, and individuals that are watching live tonight, but also those who watch later. Um, we can set up any kind of an agreement that works for you all where I would be happy to continue to talk with you about issues that we can't get to and solve all the way in, in a one hour kind of Facebook Live. But I, I'm delighted to be here, so thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. I'm gonna share my screen um, because I always think it's nice to kind of have the context of people that are important in our lives. And so Charlene has shared some photos with me. So here's her da darling daughter, Megan, and her boyfriend. And then Jim, um, who some of you may have seen in different workshops. Um, he also was the founder of the Southern Disability Law Center. And Charlene tells me he is now retired and is the chief salad maker at the house. 
That's with right. no less than 12 ingredients in all his salads, but is enjoying time, um, you know, to do those things in life that are important. And as a attorney, he always was very busy helping others. And so I'm excited that he gets some time to kind of kick back and, and now um, enjoy some other things. But there's sweet Charlene. And is that down in New Orleans? Is that picture? That picture was actually taken in Rome. Oh, okay. And then the next picture is you and your mom in Sicily, right? Yes. Look at that. Well, that looks pretty sweet. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. Um, and so not only has Charlene been in the education and advocacy field for decades, but I'm sure having a husband who was a special ed attorney and an attorney for others, um, you've had some lively discussions in your household. Oh my gosh, <laughs> absolutely, we absolutely have. And it, it has been a complimentary kind of thing because we've learned from each other. We haven't always agreed, but we've learned from each other. <laughs> I bet, and I thought it would be maybe helpful for people if we can kind of go back in time to when you were an inclusion specialist for the very first pilot of an inclusion project in the state of Louisiana, because I know that was a pivotal time for you. So if you can kind of take us back and, and give us a peek into what that was about. <laughs> I, well, I would be happy to. Um, that I was a young teacher, a young special education teacher, and I had, I got a degree from um, Peabody College for Teachers and went the whole time saying to all of my advisors, don't talk to me about regular education, double major, I don't wanna deal with those regular kids, I just wanna do the special thing. Those are my kids. And it is so interesting now to have, to look back and think to myself, wow, I should have had that general ed double major with my special ed major, it really would have served me well in my career. But I, I got an opportunity, um, two things were happening at the same time that, that brought this opportunity to me. One was that um, Jim was working on uh, some, some policy uh, development and also with some educators developing some teaching strategies that were put together in a package called Rights Without Labels. Ooh, I love and it. And that was a wonderful sort of political, huh. but also um, practical movement happening at the state level. So um, the special education director where I was working knew that I had learned some things about delivering service in the general ed setting. And she decided that she would create a pilot and allowed me to be the leader in that pilot. So um, my, um, I would say the capsule version of my experience is that I learned so much from those general education teachers, almost I would say as much and as valuable, the lessons were as valuable as the ones that I learned in my pre-service degree, which was a strong program um, with lots of experience with kids. So I, um, I had a really positive experience with that, even though there was resistance from some folks and even though we were just beginning to sort of develop what are the bedrock beliefs that we are standing on to get kids um, served in the general education class? And then what are the strategies we can bring to bear on that effort to help kids to be successful? Not only to be, you know, um, to have their place of belonging in the general ed setting so that that was their first home and that their services were something that were delivered or that they um, received, but that their, their identity and their place of belonging was never questioned. That the home base, we, we called it that at that time, mm -hmm. that their home base was in, in the general education class. 
So the, as I said, it was it was bumpy. I'm you know I'm not going to say it was a smooth ride all the way down the road, but we were learning at the time. And I worked with a lot of um, amazing general educators. As I said, very instructive to me about how to make learning interesting. And at that time, I I developed this belief that special educators. Um, are or maybe were more so now. General educators get more of this now, but but when I was first educated in my in my bachelor's degree, we were taught the science of teaching. But when I went into those general education classrooms, I really saw what the art of teaching was about: how to make, um, you know, history. Uh, and the study of certain wars come to life for kids. And those teachers really had ways to do that. And they had stuff coming out of their ears where, you know, in the special education classroom, you know, we still had uh, plastic money and a cardboard cut out of the bus so kids could learn how to ride the bus, if you can believe that. But that was true. I mean, first of all, I'm old as dirt. So I was teaching when dinosaurs roamed the earth. So was I. Right? So that was interesting. And, and it makes me think, um, of course, you jump forward in time to now. And, and I always wonder when I'm, when I'm working with someone like you and with other families like the ones that you've invited in to this, to this session, I wonder what is the burning question maybe that they have. So if there are live um, participants that you have a, something you don't want to leave this session without knowing. I would love to see you type that question in. So Charmaine might be able to feed those in as we go, either all at one time or as you see fit, you know, as you see that they fit in, in the context of our conversation. Sure. And I wanted to welcome, we have some people that are on with us and Others haven't said hi yet, so make sure you say hi so I can greet you. But Amanda from Virginia is here, and she met your husband, Jim, at the William and um, Mary Law School when she was taking yes. one of Pete Wright's groups, so our trainings. Jennifer is here from Texas. You know Jennifer. Oh, <laughs> yes, a buddy from way back. I know. And we have Sarah from Seattle, so that's pretty cool. I love all these people. We have um, a person on, I think her name is Mayra from California, and Nancy is here from Colorado. So that's pretty cool. Um, Sarah has a question we might want to start out with. Charlene, she says, my daughter is fully included, but I don't have a very good sense about whether or not she is actually getting taught appropriately. So maybe we could look at that area. Okay, and, and, and is, is a, it is a great place to start because, um, you know, I get these little phrases where I think, oh, this is the most important thing, or that is the most important thing. And through the years, one of those most important things has been, this should be about learning for kids. Yes, it's about belonging, but it is also about learning. What, if you get there and you belong and you graduate and you don't and you cannot get a job, <laughs> we have not done what we were supposed to do. So I'm wondering if um, if Sarah, it's Sarah who has the question. Right, Sarah, if Sarah uh -huh. is finding that, and if other people find that the IEP and the progress reports that are coming forward from the school regularly, as the law requires, as as at the same time as, as general ed gets their report cards, are, are you not finding that that vehicle is giving you information about whether or not your daughter is learning or your daughters and sons are learning? So that should be a way that we can find out, that we can know, are all children making sufficient progress on the goals, and what is the evidence of that? And I think it's a really good idea to just sit down with teachers and say, hey, tell me how you know that my daughter is learning some things. What are those things that she's learning? Are they the priority items that we identified in the IEP committee? 
Um, and how do you know she knows those things? Um, I'd also go ahead and look at what is the progress that you see in your child as a person? When you're interacting with your child, do you see, oh, she's growing in this way or that way, she's more outgoing or she's able to greet people or I'm hearing certain language for the first time I've never heard she isn't hasn't used language before as a strong um, way to get her needs met she's used other ways so look at the documents that are coming home if they're meaningless that's a problem you got to get in there and make those documents meaningful to you right so one of those other little coined phrases that I've I've taken throughout the years that have gotten warmer or cooler depending on what was happening at the time is this um, it's got to make sense so if it doesn't make sense to you anytime the process of educating your kid stops making sense it's time to call a halt and and have a meeting and say okay let's get back to a point where I can understand what's going on that's crucial to me yeah, and I'm sure that's a challenge. Um, Sarah, her daughter's in kindergarten, so this is like the process is so new, just yes. having your child start school to begin with. Of course. Um, and she says that she's one of the first kiddos with the intellectual disability um, to be in a general ed classroom and not in self-contained. Um, she's, and Sarah adds that she is making progress on her goals, so she says yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is awesome, and Sarah obviously has a way to know that the, she's making progress on her goals. And so maybe um, we're, we're looking at adding some information as a parent or as a family how am I discovering myself whether my child is making progress? What am I doing during her regular life outside of school that lets me know if she's making progress? I mean, are we counting apples as we're putting them in the grocery cart together, and is she counting higher? Is she saying hi to the people at the grocery store that she never would do before? Or um, not knowing the individual students obviously is a big disadvantage, but what I'm trying to, um, to convey is that there are lots of ways to note learning. And you may be seeing them and not recognizing them as indicators of progress. So let yourself recognize those things as a mom. Right. And of course, kindergarten, you're right, Charmaine. Everybody is, you know, having the willies <laughs> leaving their kids at kindergarten. That's just. So, okay, let's go back to those little coined phrases off and on that have been important. And one of them is, is this really a disability issue? So is this really about Down syndrome or is this about, I'm a mom who's got their first child going to kindergarten, I don't know how to look for progress in kids? Um, because that's a time when we really should see kids very well able to um, to broaden their experiences and their learning should be should be blossoming. All kids, you know, I really think we would be hard pressed to find a person who can't go to kindergarten. Right, right. Because in the old days, we used to have, you know, we used to have battles with school districts in you know various states where I have lived. Um, you know, this child um, is too limited. To go to kindergarten so you know I think you're hard-pressed to make that case at this moment in time we 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 really don't want to be hearing from parents people are saying you know my kid can't go to kindergarten they have to go to self-contained right right you know, there has to there must be a huge massive reason for that well and I know when um, my son Dylan was three I went through the partners program in Colorado and um, so I knew, you know, it takes time for schools to create change and look at, you know, things in a new way. So I started talking to my son's um, principal of the school he'd be attending, saying, you know, in a couple of years, Dylan will be coming to kindergarten here. And I remember the principal saying, well, Charmaine, you know, it kind of depends on his needs. And I was like, no, actually, <laughs> this is his neighborhood school. And so let's figure out how we can make this happen. But um, 
So yeah, it can it can be a challenge on many on many levels. And I we have Val from Idaho. So hey Val, she says that her um, child is 11 years old, a sixth grader who isn't advancing. Teachers say that he'll work if they sit right next to him. Of course, they can't do that all the time. I'm asking for more one-on-one -on -one with him. So this is also a pretty common um, question that I get from families, you know? Yes, and um, the so in this, it, for this question, I really revert to the teacher um, position rather than the advocate or the special education director or the, you know, the PTI person. And I, I really want to say that working independently is, cannot be identified by the people who are in charge as a reason for a ch for a child to be segregated. It doesn't make sense. But I bet you if I go and look at the IEP that Val's child has, it doesn't have a goal about learning to work independently and developing a tolerance for um, for working without an adult sitting right next to them. So I'd have some questions, of course. Has has this child had an adult all the time? Have they had a, a child-specific um, paraeducator? And, and have they developed the Velcro syndrome, if you know what I mean by that, is the paraeducator too, was too stuck to the child, therefore the child is dependent on a person. But every good teacher can say um, there are a, a gazillion ways that a teacher can encourage a child to continue to work. Um, so for example, okay, you are doing such an awesome job. I'm going to step away from your desk for about 30 seconds. Here's a timer when, uh, or here's a, a egg timer. When the egg timer gets, uh, when the sand runs out or the salt runs out, I'll be back to see what you've done and I can't wait to see the good progress you've made. Good. That's a setup for a kid to say, oh, I have a reason and I have a short period of time that this person expects that I'll work without their attention. That would be my other question, of course. Is it the attention of the person? Does the student not have um, the drive to get something done, or does he not know what to do? Right. So the, all of those things would play into what is the right strategy, but teachers can do signals that when they're walking a classroom while they're teaching, if they're, even if they're a person who prefers to stay up front, uh, there, there is no reason in the world you can't step four desks down and do a, a touch on the back of the shoulder to say you need to keep working, right? right. Um, so uh, I have something that I adapted from an amazing group of people, um, and the group's name escapes me now, but it is called the Assessment of Student Participation in General oh. Education. Sure. And what it is, it's a list of a set of skills, and it has um, it allows for opportunities for multi um, um, input, multi person input. So you'd want the mom and the teacher and the speech therapist and the whoever else has contact with the kid, everybody to do this quick um, assessment of the student. Um, uh, about 20 of the skills have to do with um, executive functioning skills that other kids would pick up as a matter of course. For example, begins a task independently. When is given a task, begins in a timely way, right. not 35 minutes after <laughs> I gave it to you. Do, can the child stay with the task? Can the child complete the task and, and put the materials back? So all of those um, those skills that help other kids get by minute to minute and, and proceed through their day. For some of our students, those ki our kids can, can shut down on one or two of those, um, of those skills. So it's good to have an, a, a hard copy assessment so that we all agree, okay, this is the piece that this child needs to work on. 
um, he can begin the task, but he can't sustain, right? So he needs right. to be able to sustain for 10 minutes or whatever it is, and we make our, obviously our expectation at the beginning, we're gonna set the kid up for success and make sure that we're asking for just a brief amount of time and tell him how fabulous that is and what a great job he did um, on something that he's getting stronger on it, right? So right. that to me is, are the, those are the exciting pieces of teaching, but, and it's all about the learning. Oh, exactly. And I wanted to mention to people, and I'll, um, I, I'll show off my son here for a second. <laughs> my son Dylan, I said, shoot, I should have had him live with us. But um, here's Dylan when he was in high school. Um, but I show these pictures just because I love the, the natural supports that Dylan got in high school. Um, and that's something I think when we're looking at independence, we need to look more at natural peer supports. But I wanted to tell folks, if you just type the word inclusion in the Facebook comments, I put together a couple of resources of handouts for you. Um, and so I'd be happy to send those along to you. So, and then I don't know, Charlene, if you have a link or something, that we can <clears throat> give people, you know, after the show, as far as the assessment that you're talking about, or? I can, sir, what's the easiest way? I can certainly share it with you. I can, um, you know, yeah, I you wanna could do just, it the easiest way. Yeah, you could just text it to me, or you can come back to my Facebook page, and you can type it in the comments, but I'll make sure that, um, you know, people know about that, because that sounds like a really good tool. Yeah, and I'd want to get it to people in the most efficient way, and I'm happy to work on that with you, Charmaine. Cool. I'm happy to. Yeah, because I think so many times we have to be good detectives yes. and figure out. I mean, what I what I don't want to have happen is a student that's not supported in the classroom having challenges, and then the teachers make this conclusion that it's not working, and the child has to go back to the special ed room. Yes. Um, and so like Charlene said, you know, depending on the situation, there's so many other things that you can look at. Um, I was just um, watching a student the other day in a fifth grade class, and it was so cool to see the other kids would just say, Josh, you know, we need to do this, or, you know, and it was like he, had a paraprofessional in the classroom, but she was at a good distance. And so she allowed his friends in the classroom to just point out, okay, we gotta go sit up here now, or we gotta do this. And, you know, it's not like we're giving the other students a teaching role per se, but just being a friend and, you know, saying, oh no, we gotta come here. And um, that can be really helpful. Uh, we also have some more friends on. So Jen is here and um, Jen Cole. And we have some other friends from Colorado. Stacia is here. We have Terry from Colorado. And um, Jennifer from Texas was saying, Charlene, if you could say um, what the assessment, the name of the assessment is again. I can. Um, the assessment of student participation in general education. Cool. And Jennifer probably has that document from like <laughs> way back and she may not remember that she has it, but I will make sure that anybody who wants that, who's listening either now or in the future, I will absolutely share it. Cool. We use it to develop IEP objectives for students who are being, um, uh, who, for students about whom people are saying it's not working. So right. I wanna say a couple of things about how it's not working. It's not working is not a real phrase. It doesn't work. If by it we mean including students with disabilities. It doesn't work, we work. And we either work and we get the objectives, uh, we get the outcomes that we're looking for, or we work and we don't get the outcomes that we're looking for, in which case we know we have to tweak what we're doing and do something different. But the old, you know, the it's not working, so you gotta go back to the whatever, doesn't, we don't have that in grown up life. We don't, that, that is a preparation for what? For 
you know, getting judged by others as to what the standard is for you to be able to stay here. That practice is archaic and absolutely can, can be barbaric. And I recommend that if it's happening, that we interfere with that as parents right away. Right. In and a I, meeting. We got to have I a meeting I agree with that. you. Yeah, it's up to us as adults. You know, like I know when I yes. was teaching, if, you know, if the student wasn't understanding the concept or the skill that we were working on, it's like, so I have to figure out another way to do this. Yes. Um, because instead of, you know, being quick to judge and blame kids, as adults, it's up to us to change what we're doing. Um, and I wanted to say, Terry has a question here or a comment from Colorado. And Terry says, I'd love to see that list of executive functioning skills because it seems more detailed than what I've seen. So cool, Terry. And we'll make sure we get the link and post it in here. Um, and Terry's also in our private membership group. So Terry, we'll, we'll talk about that some more there too. Um, Amanda from Virginia says, with only so much time in the school day, how do you prioritize social learning and academic learning when significant supports are needed in all areas and the student is performing far below grade level? Um, and I think she's talking about her son, who I think, Amanda, I'm trying to remember, it's been so long ago since I was helping you in Colorado, but um, I think he's still in elementary school, but probably upper elementary school. So that balance between social, academic learning, um, and kids that, you know, are below grade level, and again, that's not an excuse for us not to include them, but I'm sure, Charlene, you have some words of wisdom that you can share with us about that. Well, um, one of the things that, that I'd like to talk about and maybe get some clarification on, in Louisiana, we currently have um, our Louisiana student standards which are the general education standards. And of course, those are the standards that we should be going to for students with disabilities and deciding of those standards, which are the most critical for the student in order for them to make progress and advance to the next grade. For kids with more significant disabilities, and I'm thinking that's, that's the kind of student we're talking about now. So performing okay. far below grade level and assumed to be conti going to continue to do that. We don't have a child who just hasn't been taught. Am right. I correct? Yeah, so, I think so. Yeah. So if we have a student who we have this phrase in our mind, they're performing far below grade level, I'm assuming we mean academically. So right. um, in Louisiana, and I don't know if this is true in other places, we do have an alternative set of standards they're called the Louisiana Connectors, but oh. those standards are cross-connected with the general education standards. So any students who are taking an alternative assessment, alternative to regular ed assessment, those kids would be working on those connectors. Oh. So I am able to look at the standards as a teacher. I can look at the standards that are going on in that upper elementary school grade level and say, in my connectors, what are the standards that are linked and what activities can I, um, as a teacher, um, co-plan with that general educator that my student can be involved in the same content, learning a related standard, but on um, with an approach that would be appropriate for a kid with a significant disability. Um, once again, I would say it's really important to me that we're prioritizing standards that we're choosing to put on IEPs really to the global uh, areas where kids need to make progress in order for their lives to change. So is there a language standard that's huge? Well, if you have a language standard that a kid is working on, they can work on it across the content areas. So we can pull that same IEP objective or goal and do teaching on that 
across the, the child's day. So for example, they're learning how to, um, to uh, communicate with peers and work in a group. They, you know, there are um, um, activities and, and group jobs that that student could take on that requires a practice of communication. So while the other kids are working very heavily on the content area, this child is working in that group to, to learn how to communicate to peers better or to, um, or to learn how to, in some cases, make sure everybody in the group has a, whatever materials they need and there's a, that can be brought all the way down to one-to-one -to -one correspondence. Mm -hmm. One student has one piece of paper and I know I'm supposed to give out one paper to one student. And that's a teaching um, opportunity. Someone has to be there to do it, either a grown-up or, or Charmaine, as you say. Very important to use those, to allow peers to do what they would do anyway. Right. We're, again, not putting them in the role of a teacher unless we're working them into becoming peer tutors, which is a whole different thing. But kids will help each other and, and, and encourage each other or direct each other in some, of, in some instances very naturally and readily if we allow it. Right. So we have to right. take a look at what's allowed in the classroom. <laughs> our, our kids talk. Who's ever doing the most talking is doing the most learning which is depressing to me tonight because this means that you and I are doing a lot of learning, Charmaine. Well, that's <laughs> but, good. Um, really you know, good. we want to we get our kids in a classroom where, keep in mind, when we're talking about knocking on the door of general education, not that we should have to knock, but in some places we still do. We're knocking on the door of general education. You're going to open that door and get what's behind there. So sometimes you get the same crummy public education everybody else is going to get in that year. You know, not every teacher is going to be fabulous for your kid. So you really got to watch those special ed supports and write them into that IEP and write in the supports that the teachers need. That piece of the IEP is so frequently overlooked and is so crucial, so crucial, especially for those kids with low incidence disabilities. Yeah, I, I find that so many parents and also a lot of teachers and administrators don't realize that you can write teacher training and you know para support and training or whatever right in that IEP and absolutely um, you know because and I don't want teachers to feel defensive like you know we're calling them out and they're they don't know how to do their job I think what it is is it's like as a parent you know when Dylan was born I didn't know what to do, you know, with this little baby and the best ways to support him and help him develop and everything. And it's like we can't expect teachers to have this broad knowledge base of how to work with all students, you know. Um, so that additional training, it can be really helpful because then the district is going to be accountable for putting some funding into that professional development. And I always tell teachers, it's not just for this one child. What we learn is going to help all our kids in our class, you know. Right. So, you know, I think sometimes teachers feel like, um, you know, oh, I have to put this special effort in. But no, it really helps everybody. Um, Lisa is here from Texas, and she says that she's in Texas, um, a wasteland for special education. And Jennifer says, me too, um, Lisa, uh, amen. And I know it's hard because, you know, sometimes we see these pockets of wonderful things happening for kids, and then we look at our own district, and it can be, you know, discouraging. Um, I think one of the things that I, I want to make sure that um, Charlene touches on, and I'm going to get to a couple other questions too, but um, is talking about changing the lens that we use when we view students and looking more at their strengths that they have and how that can really impact how we teach. Um, Lisa says, what section of the IEP is teacher training written in? And so, Lisa, you know, every state kind of has their own forms, but usually it's when you start talking about the services 
you know, related services, supplemental aids and services. And that is not only for the child, but also on behalf of the people that work with the student. So during that related service supplemental section in your IEP is where the training would be written. Um, and she says, my district avoids, avoids specific training by sending students with the same diagnosis to a campus with a specific program. Is there any benefit to this or is it administrative convenience? So maybe we'll address that and then um, talk about strengths. And Sarah's got a question about universal design for learning too. Okay, wow, that's a lot rolled up into <laughs> one, to one uh, paragraph. Charmaine, you, I, there, there is a talent to that which you just did. And I don't know what the name of it is, but I'm gonna work on it. Um, okay, I think, so let's come up out of thinking about individual planning for kids and go to that piece that you were talking about with regard to student gifts. And what I wanna do is to bring that, um, that thinking about your child and what their gifts are and what they can offer to the, the school um, community with the understanding that any child who is continually done to or done for is done a disservice because they are never seen as a giver, as a contributor. If children do not contribute to the school and the classroom community, they will not be seen as belonging ever. So if that's the problem, there's a way to get to that and it's a systemic way actually. So I would think about your, your child and so have your child at sort of the, the ground level of, of the tower that we're getting ready to go up in an elevator really, really fast. And your child and his or her gifts are at the ground level of that and whoosh up to the top of the tower where the district level people are saying, this is our school district, boy, are we proud of it. This is what we think and believe about who we are. And what you begin to do is to call the planning, the people that you're planning with, call their attention to that mission and vision that the district says they're living and dying by and say, that means my child too. I don't see anywhere in here where it says, except the ones that have blah, blah, blah. <laughs> this is about how, and every mission statement and vision statement is gonna have something about all kids learning and being a part of the global community and la, la, la. <laughs> it's all beautiful until you get down to brass tacks and you say, this action that you're doing does not match with who you say you are. Which one of these is right. untrue? It is up to the school people to decide which one of those things is untrue. That is a question that can be asked at every level from individual conversation between yourself and the teacher or yourself and the IEP planning team all the way up to that school board meeting where you should be in that room getting your three minutes and saying the following activities that are, that are going on or the following um, processes do not match with who this school district says they are. I am here to ask you which one of these things needs to be changed. Is it the mission and vision or is it these practices that we're engaged in that don't support that? Oh, Thank I love you very that. much for my three minutes and I'm going to <laughs> sit down now. I yield the floor to my next colleague. So those questions can really be asked and should be asked lovingly but repeatedly. That's yeah, I think view. that's excellent because I think, you know, not only on a district level, when we look at the website for the district and we can find their mission statement, but a lot of times individual schools will have their own mission or vision Without statement. Without question. And I think the more we use the words that they have decided are a priority, it's like, like you said, which one is untrue? You know, exactly. are we really living by this? Um, so I love how you put that, that's excellent. Um, so let's do another tool as well, which is uh, directed to the person who asked the question about sending kids to a um, centralized location for a program. 
Right. And I would say the same kind of strategy applies here. Under IDEA, which um, Charmaine and I were talking before, we need to all think of that as the floor. It's not the ceiling. It's not anything, if, if schools comply with IDEA, they should not get one prize at all. That is no great shakes. They're supposed to be doing that. I don't see anybody out at the stoplight clapping for me when I stop at the red light like I'm supposed to do, right? So we're not going to give them any big accolades for complying with the law. But when we um, take a look at those programs that the, that the district says, oh, this is the best place for your child because this is where they can be best prepared, uh, IDEA, IDEA says prepared for, um, as you all know, uh, further education, independent living, and employment. So if what is going on at that program is resulting in those um, outcomes, then maybe we would consider that's a pretty good place. The question I would have about the program is, what is it about this program that we cannot do at my child's neighborhood school? And if, there's, if it's equipment or whatever, there is a truck in every school district that can move equipment around. Um, mostly I find it comes down to a, a matter of want to. Does the district want to? So if the, the mom that was asking about administrative convenience, I would say this. If it tastes like administrative convenience to you, it probably is. Trust your initial worry. Trust your concern. I'm worried that we're sacrificing my child's belonging in the community to go get them over here in this program, and what am I getting from that? What have the other kids gotten? What's your track record with this program? Ask them for some data that shows that, you know, this is the big best thing that ever came down the pike since sliced bread. And if it is, call me because I want to know what it is <laughs> and why more of us are not doing it. Yeah, exactly. so I, I get worried about those pro centralized programs. Right, and I think, you know, that's so many times it, that is like how they've always operated. And so when they have a parent that says, you know, time out, let's look, is there another way we can accomplish this? Um, that just, you know, sometimes depending on the people that can cause distress yes. <laughs> from the teachers, like you're asking me to do something I'm not comfortable with, from maybe a teacher that is like, I'm so excited that you asked that because I also feel that way and I would love to brainstorm some ideas. So opening up that conversation can be so helpful, you know? I absolutely agree. And all of those, um, all of the, the porcupine of those strategies should all be tried first before, you know, you bring the bottom line statements like, you know, would this be good enough for the superintendent's child? Because if it's not, it's not good enough for mine. Would right. you, you know, when was the last time, you know, you uh, didn't make a change and bring your uh, coaches up to date about how to make that football team the winningest football team in this here state? Do you see what I'm saying? It's like if we're going to do that kind of approach with the football team, then by God, we should be doing it with the special education program. Why yes. are we practicing these archaic uh, practices when we would never think of doing that with the football team. Same exactly. thing with equipment or, or assistive technology or uh, things that the kids need, you know, oh, we can't uh, provide that because we don't have enough money. And the last time the football team needed uniforms and if they needed them again tomorrow, how long do you think it would take for us to make that happen? That right. would happen. I right. guarantee you Right. it would happen. Right. So that has to go all the way across the board, not yeah. just for the few. I think those analogies can be really important. It's, I read tonight, I can't remember where it was about, you know, businesses would never be satisfied with their employees using outdated, you know, practices or whatever. It's like businesses, you know, pay for their staff to get cutting edge knowledge and skills. And we need to make sure that that happens with teachers also. Um, so I was looking at, because I know we had the question about universal design for learning, um, but here's some other comments. First, Jen Cole 
is if she said yes compliance with idea should be expected i mean like you i love that analogy of nobody's clapping for you when you stop at the red light or <laughs> the stop sign <laughs> um and um lisa who had mentioned about the centralized um programs she said that schools will never get better if everyone goes along with special programs and I, and I tell parents that a lot, that what we, um, what we allow to continue will continue, you know? Absolutely. And so if we don't bring up other conversations, it's really gonna be um, challenging. So we have a couple other comments, but I want to address the one um, for universal design for learning and, um, this is a framework for education that really is a, gen, you know, to me is a general ed framework for how we um, work with students. And it's looking at it individualizing how we present information to students, how we get them to respond and show us what they've learned and how we get kids to be motivated and engaged. Um, and so, I, uh, for my next book, <laughs> when, I, when I have lots of time, I want to write a book and I, and I think what I want to call it is universal design for inclusion. Because to me, if we implement the framework of universal design for learning, that's a perfect way that we can welcome, accept, and have kids be learning next to their friends in the general ed classroom, you know? Yes. So I don't know what your thoughts are on UDL and, and using that approach. If you see many teachers implementing that in the classroom or. I know. see more of it because student engagement is now huge. Um, and I think I see more of the universal design elements without having people calling it universal design for learning, right? So I'm, I'm hopeful about the, um, the emphasis on student engagement and a variety of um, approaches in terms of presentation and also of um, student expression, uh, having students express to us what they know. That, that, that widens the horizon. In, in the classroom and in the school community. So the wider the horizon, of course, the more students can fit sort of in that rainbow, that arc of who can fit in here, right? And, and the benefit of that is when we see, when, when I say we, I mean we as a school community, especially other students and peers, when they see students who they formerly judged to be disabled, learning in a real and um, valued way, that changes the child's status in the school. They're a learner. They're not that person that needs help. Right. They're engaged in learning and they're in the mix and the mesh with the rest of the students, you know, and that to me is very valuable for all of the school community to see. Right. Um, right. And I've said community enough to, to remind myself now to say that one of the real hallmarks of amazing schooling is um, to see which teachers are focused on running their classrooms like a community. And right. that, um, and what I mean by that is how much time and attention do they spend um, providing kids with opportunities to practice um, engaging with each other in positive ways, when they make mistakes, um, to, to, to use that, um, to use the, um, the growth mindset about learning as we go and mistakes being a great opportunity to know, you know, um, this Thomas Edison made the light bulb wrong about a thousand and one times. And, you know, there was a lot of failure there, what people would normally consider failure. So that those community building pieces, I think, fit very beautifully with the universal design for learning. Because we what we do is we make a safe place 
for risk be, risky behavior to go on. By risky, I mean we're taking learning risks and we're jumping in. One of the most wonderful pieces of my career it was a very simple interaction with a student named Zach. I will never forget him, and it's a gazillion years ago. And I said to him, we were working on um, addition. It was purely a simple addition problem. And so I said to him, and what do you think would happen if we switch these numbers around and made this into a subtraction problem? And he looked me directly in the eye and he said, let's find out. Oh, wow. <laughs> so to me, that's another one of those little phrases, those coined phrases, right? Let's find that atmosphere of let's find out. Right. That to me is when you get that in a classroom and you see the person creating that energy around let's find out, that is the wow. electric living teaching that's going on there. And it is a beautiful thing. How fabulous. And you know when you don't see it, right? right. Of course, that's a heartbreaker. Right. You know, when you see the blah, 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 blah at the front <laughs> of the class and kids are like, oh, you're killing me. <laughs> You know, that know. they're killing everybody, <laughs> not just the, the regular kids, kids with disabilities, everybody's getting killed by that kind of um, instruction, you know. Right. And when after 15 years of being a special ed teacher, I wanted to go to general ed, not only to, to you know, see and show that kids can be included, but also I just love that sense of community of having your own group of kids and yes. not bouncing around the building as a special ed teacher. Yes. And what I found is kids, when we allow their voices to be heard and to know that they're safe to speak up, they come up with such wonderful ideas that we would never think of as adults. And it's like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about student voices at IEP meetings and bringing peers. I know when Dylan had friends come to meetings, his friends had such great ideas yeah. and they knew so much about Dylan as a learner and they had so, they, you know, so we have to trust that even, I mean, when I was teaching first and second grade, those young kids have good ideas if they are allowed to, Absolutely. you know, to express that. Um, yes. So, so let me link that with something about the special programs. So I'm worried about the person who has the kids go into the special programs. The special programs often are for students who have many um, ways that they are different from the majority of kids who are, are in a school. When that happens, and if those kids are communication disabled or behaviorally they have challenges, what happens is so much of the energy has to come from the grown-up people, goes to the students. You don't see those energy and ex communication exchanges between students, from student to student, or from student back to teacher. That those teachers get burned out because they're generating the energy all the time, as opposed to that first and second grade class that you just talked about, Charmaine, where the point is to try to keep so much from happening. There's so much energy and so much happening that you have to manage that flow of kids, the directions they walk in and everything, because otherwise you'll have a volcano of, you know, <laughs> kid energy. But it, it is a natural support in and of itself. The, fa the, the general ed classroom is a natural support because opportunities to communicate are there, opportunities to resolve conflict are there, opportunities to discover something new or to watch a, a friend learn something new. And light bulbs are good for everybody, not just the one who has it. They're good for right. everybody. So I think that, you know, uh, I would speak to the general class as a rich, it's a petri dish for great stuff to grow. Great stuff to grow. Oh, exactly, exactly. And I know we're coming to the top of the hour, but we still have lots of wonderful um, questions and comments in here. So I want to honor the people that are with us. It's just so wonderful. And remind you, if you're watching the replay, still please type in comments or questions because both Charlene and I can come back and respond to those. 
Um, yes. And if you weren't here earlier with us, please type in the word inclusion in the comments. And I'll give you what I did is I took some handouts that I have. Um, and one is seven ways to break down barriers to inclusion. One is about what do you say when people say, you know, your child's so far behind, they can't be included, all those common things. And then I have this one inclusions how-to handout that I made. And what I love about it, it's just a variety of ways that you can make sure inclusion is happening. And what I did with mine is laminated it. I have it in my office to remind me <laughs> of all the wonderful things that we can do. So I know some parents have used this and you know, given it to their um, classroom teacher as a reminder of all the ways that we can be successful and include kids. So just type in the word inclusion and you'll get those links. And now let me go back here to our wonderful comments. Um, make sure that I don't miss anybody. Nancy from Colorado was saying, yeah, she had mentioned earlier when I think um, Charlene, you were talking about the you know, the timer on the student's desk, that timers can really um, have. Terry says, I like the idea of having a goal around working independently. I have a fifth grader who needs a lot of support to do work, no aid, but lots of SPED and teacher support to get started and continue working. So yeah, that makes, and I know Nancy, or I know Terry and um, her son's general ed teachers are like, gyms. I mean, you want to like clone these <laughs> because it's like, yes, everybody needs to have um, wonderful teachers like this. So let me go down here and see what else we have. Um, so Amanda from Virginia was saying, I think when you were talking about the connector um, standards, she was saying that that would be similar to our alternative assessment, um, the VAAP in Virginia, there's supposed to be aligned standards, but the school, the regional program aligns them with whatever grade level the students demonstrate proficiency. So again, those are kind of those nuances. It's like, how can we use these, um, you know, connective standards, or I know in Colorado, they used to call them like extended yes. standards and make yeah. sure that they're, um, you know, used appropriately for kids. Um, so let's see what else we have here. Um, let's see. So Jen, says, any child that is continually done to or done for, we are doing a disservice for that child. So I think she was pointing out that wonderful quote that, yeah, I think is a standard that we want to live by. Um, and Lisa from Texas said that she's going to go read the district mission statement tonight. Perfect. <laughs> so yes. yes, she's taking action. And Jen asks, is it the mission or is it the practice that needs to be changed? So, so that's, you know, I think, um, again, she's kind of looking at what you had pointed out as a question that we can ask on many different levels. Um, yes. And I want to say about that, that it is not necessary to wait around to find the, to hear the answer. Whatever people are going to say at that time may not be sufficient for you. What is the important piece is that you're raising the question in the forum where it is going to make an impact. You don't even need to be invested in the answer that they give you. You know what the answer is. You need okay. to ask the question out in public, in the public venue of the IEP meeting. I even mean that to be a public venue. Right? Don't hold that question in your mind. Ask it out loud to the people who are important, and then let them figure out what the answer is. You just leave them with that, because then at that point, you're the teacher. Right, right. And Ansley is a mom from Georgia, and she's, she has a little darling daughter in second grade, and she says that she totally agrees with this, that she's finding the more 
I support my daughter at home with pre-teaching and practice, the better she's able to learn in the classroom. Awesome. Yes, yes, and that does make a huge difference when you have that partnership with the teachers and they can let you know ahead of time, you know, what they're going to be working on and you can pre-teach that vocabulary and other things. Um, and she also goes on to say, finding myself getting exhausted, though, trying to find resources to help her understand in her learning style, feeling like I'm recreating the wheel when there are probably all kinds of resources available from the school or the greater district community. How can we plug into the learning community and get the help we need as parents who don't have the education background to appropriately support our kids. So I think if you could address that, um, Charlene, as far as, you know, parents, I think, are willing to do some extra kinds of things. But when yes. you find yourself being the main person that is searching on the internet or, you know, posing questions, how can we tap into the resources that probably are already there in the district? And you know what? They're absolutely there on the internet, I promise you. Whatever it is you want to teach your kid at whatever grade level, there is some, there's material and exercises and games and videos and umpteen gazillion um, resources for that. Um, one that uh, we really like, depending on sort of what, um, age group you're talking about. Well, I first feel like Edutopia is a really good place to start. Um, but when you're looking for, um, maybe we could generate, Charmaine, a sort of list of good um, internet instructional sites for families. Um, and I would be willing to give that some, um, you know, somebody's probably already done that and you and I could do some searching around and come up with some. To, um, to post on your page. Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea because, um, and one of the things I'm gonna do in February in our private membership group is help parents look at different resources on the internet because sometimes it like takes so long to filter through what is like a junk idea and it's like, ugh, that's not really what I need. Yes. And, and when we always do that in isolation, it's like it's a tremendous burden on every parent to do that. So I love your idea because, you know, there are a number of trusted sites that I yes. think are quality resources for parents. And I think if we can, you know, I would be happy to develop a draft list and then send it to you, Charlene. I and can add you can, to. you know, add some, some other right. ones that I haven't thought of, but... Okay. Um, Let's yeah, so I think that would be a great service that we could, um, you know, provide for for our viewers. Yes, so stay tuned, mother of the darling second grader. <laughs> it is coming yes. to you. <laughs> Jennifer probably has a ton also. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, so that would be great. I mean, we can start out and then, you know, we can post it and you guys can add to that and then we can like make a new list because like I said, um, a mother searching for answers is like a wonderful detective <laughs> and they have already figured out a lot of things. So the more we share, then, yes. um, you know, the more that we can all be helping each other. Um, yeah, and, and like Ainsley was saying, you know, so many parents, they have a full-time job and then they're trying to come home and do all this, you know, so, yes. so that can be really hard. Um, Let's see. So I think we'll take one more question from Lisa because I want to respect Charlene's time. I had told her an hour. <laughs> but um, Lisa says, how do you get general ed teachers to consider students receiving special ed as their students too? So that whole, are they my students or are they special ed students, you know? Right. So my, in, in Charlene's fantasy world, all the kids belong to general education and they visit special education. If they have to go out for something and there's no way to provide it in the classroom, they go out for it. But 
um, you know, special education is the latecomer, right? So we should be considered the um, the people trying to work themselves out of a job. The 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 place of belonging. Every kid should start off. Um, even IDEA says that you know we can go all the way down to the bottom floor, which is the law, and say even IDEA says you know we start out thinking about placement as placement in the general education setting. Now. Um, how do you get general education teachers to think of everybody in the school as their own, as, as owned by general education? I think you do not do that as a parent. What you do is you talk to the principal and find out what their plans are to, um, to make it uh, uh, a matter of course in your school that all the teachers think of all the kids in the grade level as general ed kids first and as kids receiving service from special education, you put that job where it belongs, and that is with the administration at the school level, because that's who sets the tone. I mean, right. I've talked to principals who have said, in this school, we believe all kids learn in the general education setting best. We bring services and supports into them unless there's absolutely something that needs to be done outside of the classroom. Obviously. Um, personal care and things like that need to be done outside. So we get that that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Right. And the yeah. principal will say, if that is not a good fit for you, if you do not think you're going to be able to in, join in on that line of thinking, it is better for you to work someplace else. I've worked with principals like that, and I've worked with a principal um, who said to me, don't bring those vegetables into my school. So you see that there's everything out there. All you have to do is bring that question up to your principal, and then you're going to see what you're working with. If you get a principal that's thoughtful about, well, what am I already doing that gives that impression, and how can I do better at that? Um, and if you say, what you can do is say, I'm certainly willing to help. Right. You get this objective accomplished, and yeah. please call on me. For sure. And um, you know, yeah, because that culture is really set by the principal in Absolutely. the building, and the teachers kind of follow that direction. And you know that, and I, you know, parents ask like, "What's the best school? Where should my kid go?" And I say, you know, it depends because if that principal leaves or if that teacher retires, it can change so much. So. Um, Sometimes I think we just need to work with our neighborhood schools and and you know make some change at that level. Um, I did want to kind of uh, kind of wind up our show here with a couple cartoons. I know um, some people may have seen um, Michael G. and Greco's work before, but I just love his not only sense of humor but the way that he can make powerful statements. So this is one of my favorites of his cartoons, and it's called The Island in the Mainstream. <laughs> and it says, Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Cooper are still trying to figure out why Fred doesn't feel like part of the class. And if you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a student working at a separate table with probably a para. Um, and when I think about when I started teaching decades ago in the 1970s, we really didn't have many students included, um, but probably in the 80s we saw more. But what we saw is kids sitting in the back of the room coloring worksheets or stringing beads together. Um, and thankfully we have come a long way, but we still have a lot of work to do. And this next cartoon is where I hope that we can all get to. And this is a parent talking to a principal, and she's saying, in your school, do you have inclusion students, inclusion facilitators, inclusion classrooms, inclusion programs? And the principal just says, no. And the parent says, well, why not? And the principal's response is, because everyone's included. So I hope we can reach the point where inclusive education really does become 
a moot point and that this is something that we always do. We always welcome students. Um, we stop marginalizing students for a variety of reasons. We see kids as competent learners um, and we make the environment safe. We want to see them being happy as they're learning every day. Um, and so I just want to thank Charlene again for, you know, carving out this time to be with us. It's like so much fun. The only thing that I don't like is I can't give her a big hug because she's just such a warm and wonderful person. I just love you, Charlene. So thank, thank you, you so Charmaine. much, Charmaine. It is a mutual admiration society. <laughs> and I loved being with the, the people on your Facebook Live, even though I can't see them. I and I hope that uh, we can continue to be engaged in this conversation in various ways. I'd love to come back another time and we can talk more deeply about a certain individual topic or whatever might work for the people that are out there and, and according to what they need. But we'll certainly do two things, get that assessment out to you, and also we'll work on that resource list for parents who want to teach kids and need fast and reliable resources. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And thank you. Thank to you. To our viewers that are here live or our viewers that are watching the replay, know that you can type in comments and questions as you, they come up throughout the night, throughout the next few days. Um, we'll come back and answer those and respond. So um, this has been a special evening broadcast, but we'll be back next Thursday. I do live shows typically at noon Mountain Time on Thursdays. So until then, I'm Charmaine Tanner, and I just hope and just, I don't know, send you lots of passionate energy that you can continue to make wonderful differences for your children every day at school. So thank you for being with us, and we shall see you next Thursday. Good night, everyone. <laughs>